This is Pillieter. Today is July 27th, 2022. I'm here with Cartrell Payne, and today we have on is Norma Jean. Hello. Hi there. Uh, for some reason, I can't see you, but... It's okay. Uh, I'm kind of... I'm in San Francisco at the moment. I'm just busy multitasking, but uh, Norma, what are you about? Where am I about? What are you about? <laughs> I don't know. I'm in Los Angeles. Is that what you mean? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm so out of touch with society these days. I don't know what the new language is. Uh, I wanted to ask them, um, like, what made you join a police force? Like, <laughs> what made me join it? I needed a job because I was leaving my first husband, and um, he had applied for the job, and he already started working as a carpenter, making a, a pretty good living. So I filled out the application and I got the job. It was just bad timing and bad luck. I mean, yeah, you know, because the LAPD, especially at the time, had a reputation for being, well, let's face it, kind of reactionary. <laughs> yes, but I didn't know that. I didn't know it because the, I, I didn't watch a lot of television. I didn't read a lot of newspapers. I kind of lived in my own little world. And it just seemed like it would be a good job. It paid well. So I took the job and um, in many ways, I regret that choice. Uh, in some ways, it helped shape who I am and what I became and how it changed the rest of my life in order to be able to fight for sex worker rights. Cause I don't know that I would ever have become a sex worker if, if I hadn't had those years because I wouldn't have known about the police corruption I wouldn't have needed to have a forum to expose that corruption. So I don't know. I mean, in a, in a lot of ways, it was good and it was bad. But, you know, here I am. I did it. So I can't go back and change my history. I mean, yeah, because you were kind of like a, I guess you could say media darling in the 80s and the 90s. Like you were on a lot of shows. And oh, stuff. yeah. Yeah, so well, that's because I'm an outspoken whore. I got a mouth on me. I swear. Um, I try to make light of things because a lot of times people are not acceptive of really hard, difficult issues. If you, you know, if you're like, yeah, blah, blah, blah. you know, the cops are doing this, the cops are doing that. They don't, they don't listen. So what I had to do is use my very warped sense of humor um in order to reach out to people and make fun of the system and i mean it worked well for me because it got me on a lot of talk shows because everybody wanted that that famous whore with a you know with a loud mouth <laughs> so it, that worked out what was your um i'm just oh. curious too so you were active in the adult industry about uh 20 years ago or... Oh, no, I left the LAPD and um, I was there from 1972 to 1982. In 1982, I left after an on-duty traffic accident, my last one, and I said, that's it. I tore up my uniform and cut up my shoes so I wouldn't be tempted to go back. And I had met a call girl when I was on the LAPD. When I was working nights, I was driving my patrol car up on Hollywood Boulevard over, you know, towards the other end, not where the, a lot of the buildings were, but near Nicholas Canyon. And um, she flagged me down because she was being followed by some guys. So she asked me if I'd follow her home and I did. And then we started talking and she told me what she was, that she was a call girl. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> she was a lot happier than I was. And, you know, cause I was so angry at that time. I was angry at the LAPD. I was angry cause they, you know, Daryl Gates was doing all kinds of crap. And I just, I was not happy person and she was. And I thought, what's wrong with this scenario? Here is someone who is doing something that is illegal, but yet is tolerated by the cops because the cops were having sex with prostitutes all the time. Um, and, and she's happy. And I have an on, a quote unquote honest job with the LAPD and I'm miserable. So when I left after the, the last on-duty accident that I had when a drunk driver in a stolen car rear-ended my police car, 
and I was off work and on disability. And when they said, all right, it's time for you to come back. And I said, I'm not coming back. I went to her and she introduced me to her madam and I started working and I'm like, wow, <laughs> that's the best job I ever had. And it was, I mean, it was for me back in 1982, I, I was making really good money and I met a lot of very interesting people, a lot of interesting clients, people whose names you would know if I said which celebrity and producer and all that that I had uh, intimacy with. What, have I made you quiet? <laughs> Did you no, know? No. Did you know of Eric Edwards? Eric Edwards, the name doesn't sound familiar. We had him on a podcast like a week ago. He, he used to do uh, porn some time ago. Okay, yeah, but, no, porn came along. Say, porn was still illegal back then. Um, it was, it still occurred, of course, but it wasn't something that was open. And my husband and I filed the first lawsuit to get the porn laws overturned. Um, we were not successful because by the time it went to court, I was already going to prison. But um, what's his name? I can't think of his name right now. Uh, Hal Freeman. He filed also to overturn the pandering and prostitution laws. And his case won. But ours, of course, was rejected because I was already in prison. So. I mean, yeah. So what was it like being a call girl in, in Beverly Hills like? What was it like being a call girl in Beverly Hills? Yeah. It was very interesting. Like I said, I met some very interesting people, people whose names you would know. Um, the fantasies that my clients had, I, it was during the time that I was working that I discovered I was bisexual. And I often did doubles with other women and our clients. And I mean, it was just, it was a fascinating experience, and I'm sorry that I'm too old to do it anymore. <laughs> the, the industry has uh, changed a lot since today. I imagine it was very different back then, considering when you said that porn was not exactly legal, so there basically right. was a subculture of just call girls over porn. There was, yes, there was. Um, and, of course, I mean, I got to meet all of the porn stars as I became an activist. Of course, I knew Ron Jeremy very well. Um, and and what I got, there's so many of them uh, that, I, that I got to know. And I my husband and I were involved in swinging and we also went to uh, porn parties and things like that. So I knew a lot of the people in the porn industry. But I, I, didn't, want, I didn't want to do porn because I'm not one to spend hours doing the same shoot over and over again I just that, that's also why I never got into being an actress is because that was too boring for me so I mean I just, yeah I liked, it, I liked it better going to see a client being there for an hour or two getting paid like you know five ten thousand dollars and going home that was good for me I mean it sounded like California used to be fun back in the day unfortunately oh, yeah. it's, it's too expensive now and gentrification is driving everybody out well that's true it's and hopefully someday i'll be out of california too with any luck we'll be moving to las vegas yeah you know california is for rich people now you know well yeah that's true it is so and we're not rich believe me the whole thing fighting the lapd left us absolutely broke so you know, I mean, connections, um, everything. It just cost so much money, and and I didn't win. And then spending three years, you know, fifty days in solitary, two years and seven months on probation when I couldn't violate the law, or I'd go back to prison. But then I went back to prison anyway because the DA appealed my sentence because I was commercially exploiting my law enforcement past to draw on scandalous escapades that undermine respect for the law, and that meant that I needed to be in prison to shut me up. It didn't help because I didn't shut up. So I was just wanted to add on. So your connections, you're more connected with the veterans rather than today's adult industry. Uh, well, I mean, I know them, yes, but no. I mean, I'm I'm a sex worker rights activist, and my primary concern is getting uh, 
commercial sex de prostitution decriminalized. And people in the porn industry, because they're not outlaws, they tend to have an attitude of, well, I'm not a prostitute, so I don't need to be involved in the sex worker rights movement. But they yeah. don't understand that the porn laws are also very fragile because you've got these religious bigots that want to stop people from making porn, watching porn, whatever. They want to stop it because they feel it's immoral. And it's their right to feel it's immoral. It's just not their right to stop other people from doing it. But yeah, that's it. And so, yes, I'm, I have contacts with the old crowd of porn stars. Um, you know, Annie Sprinkle is a very good friend of mine and uh, Nina Hartley and, all, you know, a lot of the old, old core people. I mean, yeah, you know, you know, of course, you know, some porn stars are hypocrites because, you know, some escort on the side and stuff yeah. like that. I know. <laughs> yeah, they do. And, and they don't they don't see themselves, though, as sex workers, per se. Um, and they don't think they need to be involved in changing the laws. So. And that's, that makes me really sad that they don't understand. We need everybody in the porn industry, as anybody that does anything that the religious right wants to ban, they need to get together with all of us and keep that from happening and decriminalizing prostitution at the same time. So. I mean, I mean, yeah. You know, I mean, it seems to me there seems to be like a disconnect between other sex workers and stuff, you know, like strippers and porn stars and, you know, prostitutes, they all kind of, I wouldn't say look down on each other, but they kind of like see each other as different. Yeah, they do. Unfortunately, it's like, no, we're all the same and we all do sex work. Whatever, whatever way you do it, it's still sex work and we need sex workers to be strong together and change the laws and make sure we we don't ever go to jail or prison again for being paid to have sex whether on camera or with individuals have you ever came across cases where even on basic as something as tinder where a woman could be beating a man and she's like yeah we can have sex but would you be interested you know pay me 200 dollars for it Sometimes they could label that as prostitution, but a lot of that goes on today in culture. Yeah, that is prostitution. Yeah. And yet it's funny because if cops were to catch them, I guess they would be arrested for prostitution, even though they could just meet up on Tinder and then mm -hmm. in person being like, well, I could do whatever you want. So as long as you pay me, even though they might need the money for a living, it seems a little ridiculous to, you know, get the cops involved with something so as small. So I think a lot of that sex work is pretty much just under the radar or it's just today from my own experience it's it's happening on like you know tinder or even bumble where the woman chooses the man so i don't know if you have any uh cases of what 2022 uh sex work looks like um well you know i like i said i'm still very much involved in the sex worker rights movement i'm i'm involved in the political end of it um what i do because i don't get to go out of the house or meet other people. I take care of my 88 year old disabled husband. So I'm like housebound. But what I do is I put numbers together so that activists can use the information that I pull together and put on my website, policeprostitutionandpolitics.com and give them ammunition to fight against the moral majority and others who want to see all extra or extra curricular activity people having sex outside of marriage that's really what their goal is to stop all sex outside of marriage but um we want to give them ammunition say look here's the reality i mean people talk about uh child sex trafficking and they make that's one of the reasons what they use uh, to to go after people in the porn industry and anything else. They say, oh, there's 100,000 to 300,000 children being trafficked into prostitution every year. Well, that's utter bullshit, pardon my language. And the reason is because we have the FBI statistics on how many actual cases are confirmed to be sex trafficking. 
And those are the numbers I put together. Um, I think it was in 2019 or the 2020, no, the 2020, because 2021 is not available yet. But for 2000, 2020, um, there were like 13 minors charged or rescued from prostitution, uh, not 100,000, not 300,000. So it's like they're, the numbers that these radical feminists and the abolitionists, the religious abolitionists cite are just so far off base. But people don't know that, except that I make it available for all the sex worker activists to use. And whenever they, they the activists go out and speak about the, this issue, they've got the FBI statistics, you know, and it's like there's other problems with those kinds of numbers, because if you had 100,000 to 300,000 children every year and those children and they do get arrested, by the way, the cops arrest kids for prostitution, um, but they amount to about six or 8% of all arrests. The majority of arrests are for adults. And if you have only like six or 8% being 100,000 to 300,000, which obviously is not possible, then how many adults do you have that are prostitutes? And how many men would you need to supply these children and adults with work? I mean, because these abolitionists claim that that prostitutes have to see between um, eight and 10 or 20 men a day, let's say. It's like, well, then where are you going to get all these men? You know, that well, we would need to import men from Mars in order to accommodate sex workers to have enough money to live on. So that's what I do is I give them ammunition. Um, everything that I put together on my website is backed up with links directly to the FBI's websites so that there's access. It's not me saying these things. It's the FBI statistics that I use. And you can go there, you can look at them, you can pull it up, and they can then show somebody that says, there's still 100,000 children. It's like, uh, I don't think so. So... Has there any been a particular case in your work that was you would deem controversial or unfair with law or where you would say, you know, this is like motivating me why legalizing sex work is important? Have you ever seen like a sex worker get in trouble with the law that something is so as uh, yes. passive? Like if there was there any recent case or something that defined a moment of like, this is so ridiculous or this is just so stupid on its head. Well, I mean, all of it is ridiculous and stupid, but I think it was my own, very own case that motivated me because I thought, how on earth is it possible for someone to get arrested when all they say is words? And the words they say, you know, that they really are not something like, you know, you're going to go out and get fucked and, you know, you have to do 100 men a day or anything like that. Just what happened is my my dear friend on the LAPD, Penny, we had lunch uh, after I had become a call girl. And I was telling her all about my new life as a call girl, which I had no embarrassment about. Um, and she said, gee, Norma Jean, you know, I've always fantasized about being a call girl. If I was young and attractive, I'd make a million dollars. Well, obviously she was not young. She was not attractive. She was at the time 50 years old, six foot two and weighed about 250 pounds. So she was not call girl material. And so I told her that if I ever found a client who liked her type, I'd be happy to let her know. I did have a client who liked taller, older women than me. So I called her up and I said, would you like to see my friend, Harry? Harry was Governor George Duke Majin's cousin. And um, unfortunately, I didn't know it, but my phones were being tapped by my former fellow officers. So when I said to her that I had a client, and he would, you know, pay her because I had to pay. I was going to pay the client to see her because he didn't want to see her. So when I told her about the date and she was wired, um, basically, she said, well, what do I have to do? I said, nothing you haven't done in a normal adult relationship. She said, is there money involved? I said, yes, that is a felony with a mandatory 
three to six year prison term on the first offense with no prior convictions. And that's what they charged me with. And though the date never took place, money was never exchanged. She never met Harry. Um, and all that, what, that was happening was our conversation. That got me sent to prison not once, but twice, because they appealed my probation that the judge gave me after I was in solitary for 50 days being studied to see if I was dangerous to society. So then I, for two years and seven months, I was on probation with no violations. And then they overturned my sentence and I was resentenced to three years in state prison. I was in with the Manson family women and other notorious murderesses. And um, so I thought that was pretty egregious. And I think that's one of the reasons I am such an advocate for decriminalization because it is absolutely unconscionable that you can have a conversation with someone and go to prison for it while people like the cops can have sex with 10 year old girls like Michael Casados did. He was a cop on, in Hollywood and I knew him. He was having sex with a 10 year old girl for five years from the time she was 10 till she was 15. He got arrested. He got probation. How do you do that? How do you have sex with a child for exactly. five years and not go to prison while someone who has words with a 50-year-old woman goes to prison because she won't fucking shut up about police corruption? How does even pedophile happen? Pedophilia <laughs> happen in those ranks? I don't know. Oh, you have no idea how many cops fuck children. You have no idea. You can go to my website and see the cops having all the lists, the long, long list of cops who have sex with minors. It is so disgusting. And most of them do not get arrested. Most of them do not go to prison. They get probation if they get arrested. Yeah, so what do you think about in the news, you know, it's been in the news recently that, you know, there are gangs inside the LAPD, you know, stuff like that. I've known that for a long time. They've always had gangs inside the LAPD. I mean, it's, a, you know, I call the LAPD the blue mafia. I mean, it's, it's true. I mean, yes, it's not it for is. nothing that they're like the least respected police department in the country. It's like, I know. Well, what they do is they run on the reputation they allegedly have because of Adam 12 and other cop shows that take place in L.A. Yeah, like Dragnet and all that. Yeah, exactly. These cops are the the icon of, of purity and, of you know, kindness and honesty and all that. Nothing could be further from the truth. So, I mean, of course, I mean, like. I mean, the LAPD are the reason that, you know, the Watts riots started and also the LA riots started in 92. Yep. They were responsible for both. Yep. The, the, after Rodney King beating. In fact, it was the Rodney King beating that finally got my book published. And the reason was because before that, publishers were afraid to take on Daryl Gates. And they, you know, it's like, here's my book. You know, I've got evidence here. I went to prison and all this. And it's like, well, yeah, but we don't want to piss off Daryl Gates. And then the, the riots happened after Rodney King. Now, my husband and I lived in the um, Koreatown area at the time of the riots. And we lived like five buildings away from where all four corners of our street on 3rd Street in Kenmore were on fire during the riots. And we were terrified because we had no way to get out because the street was blocked with cars. Fire trucks couldn't get in. Cops couldn't get in. Friends couldn't come and rescue us. And we had a crawl because we had an apartment that was facing the street and it was upstairs and it had a floor to ceiling window. So you could see right up there. And and the, the uh, rioters were going up and down the street, shooting off their guns in the air. And it was like we were just terrified. But because that happened, and finally publishers saw Daryl Gates's vulnerability, that's when I got a publisher, Simon and Schuster, and they did my book. But before that, you know, people just didn't want to believe that the LAPD was as bad as it was. 
Is there any current crimes that the LAPD is doing now? I mean, with kind of post George Floyd they ever environment. Stop? <laughs> I, you know, I have nothing to do with the LAPD anymore. But you know that old habits never die, and as long as they can get away with the stuff they get away with, they will continue doing what they do. I mean, every few years, you you think that they're going to clean up the police department doesn't happen as long as you have laws against drugs gambling and prostitution you will have police corruption period because every cop that works those details can be corrupted give them a little money give them a little sex they're good to go you know they'll give you a ticket or whatever but it's always going to be corrupt until you change the laws and decriminalize the vices that people have what is like the um, call girl scene of today, if that's still what it's called, car girl, call girl? Yeah, of I mean, course, there's still it. call girls. There's still still a lot of call girls, and a lot of them now are using the internet to find clients. I mean, unfortunately, Backpage, which was very important for a lot of people in the sex industry, they were closed down because allegedly they were promoting children on their site, which they were not. Um, but it's like it changes only in the way that people are interacting with their clients they can have an on uh what is it not not uh um only fans or something like that yeah they can have those sites and that's how they interact with potential clients they can do screening which protects them somewhat it doesn't protect them entirely but it does protect them somewhat because they can they, they, a lot of them are very, very savvy, and they know how to get around saying things that will get them arrested. Because the arrest comes not because you have sex with someone, but because you say sex and money in in a conversation. That's what will get you busted. It seems like OnlyFans is basically the safer way today. But as I said before, it seems like a paradox in law. You can worship a model and give her money, yeah. but that's not prostitution. It's kind no, of just, of um, but you said it's only words. It's like, I'm coming over to have sex with you or something. Even though today's yeah. OnlyFans models, I think would probably get away with some sexual fa transaction if a man gives her like 200 or something. Uh, at, at least 200. I mean, I, back 200 was the minimum years and years and years ago. I don't know what the minimum is now, but that was like minimum way back when I was working. You know, my clients were mostly in the 500 to 1,000 an hour or more. Like my $10,000 client. That was one night, no sex because he just had a fantasy and the fantasy was that I dressed him up like he was a woman and I told him how beautiful he was. That seems legal, but anything to do with <laughs> something, know. it's weird. I'm just trying to pick I up. know, I know, but it's nevertheless, because we made arrangements, if it, it, it that particular encounter, I wouldn't have been uh, arrested because we didn't have sex, but because there was the possibility of it that could have happened. See, what happened is when I went there, the madam sent me to see the client. And we had originally arranged for two hours. And every time it was time for me to leave, he would renegotiate and say, well, if I give you another 500, will you stay another hour? And by the time it was six o'clock in the morning, it was $10,000, no sex, just a put clothes, women's clothes on him and makeup and told him how beautiful he was. And that was it. A lot of that is interesting because it shows you how much intimacy is actually depraved in America. It sounds so beautiful to do that, yet he puts down 10K or more just to have that. And this well, might I mean, give an his argument. Do it. His, I mean, he was married, but he, his wife didn't want anything to do with his fantasy or his fetish because a lot of fetishes do not involve sex. A client who has a foot fetish um, will masturbate on your feet. There's no intercourse. I don't touch his penis. So it's just 
basically masturbation um, while with with someone there with him to talk about his fantasy. A lot of it has to do with how well you can communicate with your client and make him experience his fantasy sometimes without ever having sex. So. I mean, yeah, it's like, you know, people, Americans, we're hypocrites about this. Like, um, like everybody knows if you go on a, on a date with a girl, you know, like you gotta pay for food and all that other stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and the whole thing about dating and everything, um, you know, it's like, where's the line drawn on what is prostitution and what is just companionship or dating? It's really hard to say. So. I mean, yeah. And, you know, with regular dating, there's no guarantee of sex. You know, like the yeah. girl might be a prude or she might just be using you for free food. That's very true. A lot of them do which I think is a dishonest way to be, you know, in the sex industry, but you're not, they're not in the sex industry. They're just dishonest. And I think that's unfortunate. I, I, I think it's just so much better to be open and honest about who you are, what you want, what you expect from someone, but that's me. We're reaching the end of our podcast, but uh, Norma, is there any future projects that you have on mind or would like to share? Well, yeah, there are, but I can't share them because unfortunately I haven't got a signed contract yet. My next book and possibly a docu-series and possibly a scripted series, so who knows? I just, it's, it's interesting because you're mentioning about, just, I just wanted to go back on the whole you know, desire thing. I guess in a way, the one night stand, quote unquote, today would be considered free prostitution if they were to play the game of such, quote unquote, hookup culture. Mm -hmm. How do you compare and contrast hookup culture to, um, you know, the call girl status? It seems like both are very similar, but no, one is more about non-transactions without money. Well, that's that's true, but I, I think that the... Um... I think that women have a right to say no uh, if they don't want to have sex with someone, if they go out to dinner or whatever, but I think they should be upfront about it. Like, you know, I, I, I want you to wine me and dine me and take me places, nice places, but I'm not going to have sex with you. But most of them just can't be bothered to be honest and upfront. Yeah, I, I think the reason that they won't be honest is because, you know, I mean, let's be honest, you know, uh, guys, like we probably just d dumped a girl right there. She said, you know, like, I'm not going to have sex with you. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it, you know, relationships are so complicated these days. And I don't know. I'm glad I'm an old lady now and long married. We've been together for 45 years. So in you know, today's relationships, to there's more people meeting on Tinder for yeah. their life than anything. And it's almost commonplace now that there is some experimentation and promiscuity before people find their click, if it is. But then there's the negative saying there's too much of that going on around. Do you have any? Uh, you know, personally, uh, personally, uh, you know, uh, I believe things were better back in the day when it came to dating and sex. Like my friend, she was a hippie in 1960 San Francisco. And she said, you know, back then people had sex without condoms and stuff. You know, there was no worry of AIDS and stuff. And you could just talk to somebody and have sex or whatever. Well, I mean, that's true. I mean, it was, it was supposedly a grand old time, but you know, in the sixties, the, I, I was still in high school in the sixties, didn't graduate till 69, but so I, and I was, Back then, I was a good Christian girl, so I would not have had sex outside of marriage anyway. So. And then I became a whore, and it's a much better life. How, how so? Well, because I'm free. I don't have the restraints that society puts on women to be good girls, to save yourself for marriage. 
And even in marriage, you're only supposed to lie there and pretend to enjoy it. And I'm like, no, I like orgasms. I, I love to fuck. So, <laughs> you know, what the hell? <laughs> so it's freeing. It's, it's, I mean, not free, like as in no money, just freeing as in I can be who I am and without any guilt, which is wonderful. And that, yeah. That's the way I think people should live. But, you know, that's just me. Yeah, that's true. They should live their life. So, Norma, uh, thank you so much for being on. Where can people find you on the internet? They can find me normaginamadovar.com. They find my website. They can find my my police prostitution and politics dot com website. Um, all they got to do is search my name in Google, and they'll find so much about me. Things I didn't even know. I mean, places that I've never expected to see myself pop up. But you know, they they they've got things in Chinese. They've got things in in Arabic. With you'll see Norma Jean Amadova, and then the rest of it's in Arabic or Chinese. And I'm like, huh. So you can find me. There's no way I can hide. This podcast was brought to you by pilleader.substack.com and as well as youtube.com slash pilleader. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you much.